four years after independence. It's still blurry what freedom really is. Quite unclear where we are going from here. We've carried a vacuum for a while now, a vacuum that only one of ours, who is true and transparent, can feel. The British were here for economic and political reasons. They needed basic administrative elite that could help them ensure that there was law and order, that there was transportation to enable the produce move from the hinterlands to the ports in Lagos and in Port Harcourt for repatriation to the mother country. Their exit in 1960 is supposed to be a foundation for a new nation. Coming after independence, what, what we saw, or what we witnessed was a continuation of that because other, after the independence struggle, people thought uh, once you have political power, you have everything. But they, unfortunately, they discovered that having political power is different from having economic power or having development, which has uh, seemed to have eluded us. We have had a very inept, very prebenda, very megalomaniac, and if you like, a narcissistic political class, a mindless political leadership that has navigated the ship of state into an eschewable aqua of socio-political quagmire and phantasmagoria. It is regrettable, if you ask me. A government of public consensus a government that is true and transparent, a government that is accountable, a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That is a government that the people will yearn for. Governance was not really for our people. It was for the people to the extent that they were supposed to serve the interest of the masters. People like Chivaolo, people like Dr. Michael Okbara, people like Amadou Bello, were more concerned about long-term development of their people. Eastern Nigeria lagged behind Western Nigeria significantly in education, but in spite of limited resources, they created a phenomenon of the missionaries collaborating with the government and with the communities, which allowed Eastern Nigeria to leapfrog and catch up with Western Nigeria in education. These are uh, some of the kinds of things that you expect governance to be about. If we can have a country, we are irrespective of party, whether you're in the PDP, you're in the APC, or you're in APGA, or you're in Labour Party, if we are, you find something good in Labour Party state, you pick it. Because it's not the party that benefits, it's the people that benefit, and it's the people that put you there. First television station in Africa was WNTV in Ibado. And as somebody who grew up going to school in Ibadan. I remember from the 60s, the payoff line of WNTV. WNTV, first in Africa. Well, Eastern Nigeria followed literally within weeks, and they couldn't be outdone. So how was their own payoff line? Eastern Nigeria Broadcasting Service Television, second to none. So it was the beauty of the evolution of good governance in Nigeria in those days. Agriculture is a production of food and fiber from the world's land and waters. Without agriculture, it is impossible for any civilization to thrive. It is indeed the foundation of any civilization and a stable economy. One of our problems is our major shift from a producing and exporting country to one that is importing and consuming. We have allowed our cocoa farms and granite pyramids to vanish. Until we are able to reverse this, our gazillion of efforts in both human and financial resources will translate to the foreign GDP of other countries. And that will leave us in rubbish until we have nothing left. O 
consortium plans to provide 10% of the 3.5 billion naira worth of food consumed in Lagos daily. That's 350 million naira daily. And that will be 10.5 billion naira per month. Shu has put in place structural and transport policies that will support this. Oshu has built minds that believe this. Oshu is close to doing this. If government does not fund access to rural communities, there won't be agricultural produce taken to the major markets and the people in the rural communities will be improvish. Their, their poverty level will increase because they won't be able to sell their market produce at the right price. And again, there'll be rural urban migration. Nobody wants to stay in the rural area again because there is no access. And once the cities are congested, government, I know, there are challenges to be able to keep up with the pace of the rural urban drift right now. But once the rural communities have this access, you can stay in your rural area and come to work in the city and go back that day. I mean, there will be a balance in life. Before the discovery of the oil, Nigeria depends solely on agriculture for survival. The West was exporting cocoa, uh, the East, palm oil, and the North, uh, Grand North. Whatever the digital education I had today was from this agricultural income that was then accruing to the government of the Western region. Right from the beginning, in the 50s, they have the marketing board which you used to encourage those who are in the uh, planting cocoa, palm kernel, and palm oil to encourage them to harvest, to sell uh, for particular uh, prices. And in any case, government assisted in keeping the, uh, all, all the parameters up to, so that this thing can get into the foreign market and command some good price. Lori or Oja Tita Nira, Kosani Katoja Pe, also Pe or Jangota, Batan Rioko, Tofuku, and Ale Oroko, and Tony Bilawala to cook, Oroko to the Pifuku. There are places that uh, the project has taken place all over some parts of the country, and even here. The, the, the economic earning power of those communities greatly improved because they now can take their produce with, direct to the market without middlemen and sell it at the correct price, and they earn more from there. No way you can dissociate access, accessibility from uh, uh, developmental uh, processes, be it economic development, be it social, be it even political. The, 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 the need for accessibility is uh, very imperative in uh, all uh, developments. Lagbara Olorun, bi mo se nwo daada. Mo nwo ye pe ni baba ma so pe odun meta si bita wa yi. Mo ni promise or some state. We pe koko ni o, ogede ni o, ege ni o, po epo ni o, ko ni di pe won wa lo sibo mi mo. To the pay are name, a corner, A system that gives farmers all agricultural inputs in great quality and on time, supports and watches over them and make available a demand structure that buys the produce of them with great profit margin is a system for the people. That is a start point for a government that is of the people. The Oshun Brawlers Outgrowers Production Scheme, OBOPS, is a foolproof circuit that supports poultry farmers. It provides everything needed to run the scheme and still creates a demand for it in the school feeding program. Today, I know there must be at least 600, 700 farmsteads in Oshun State alone doing nothing but producing chicken. Oshun uh, Brawler Outgrower Scheme is made up of three partners. Number one partner is the government. Number two go uh, partner is the Poultry Association of Oshun State chapter. And uh, the number four, number one is we, the private sector. The responsibility of the government is to provide the funds 
for the feed that the birds under this scheme would consume. The second responsibility of the government is to provide advance for farmers. This advance for farmers incorporates the funds for labor, funds for energy, funds for transportation, funds for miscellaneous and exigencies. The responsibility of Toons Farm as an equity contributor is to provide 100,000 day old chicks on a monthly basis, which has risen to 200,000 day old chicks on a monthly basis. The well, responsibility of Poultry Association of Nigeria, State of Ocean Chapter, is to provide the necessary infrastructure and the members to benefit from this scheme. It's a free EU. No political inclination. If you are a farmer and you have your pen, you go straight to the uh, Poultry Association of Nigeria, you register as a member. When you register, they come and check your farm. If your farm is suitable, they send your farm to the scheme manager. With that, the scheme manager will process your farm and grant you all the, all, the, all the facilities involved. Farming is all about impact. What impact does it have on? This one has impact on the farmer himself. It has an impact on the, uh, on the, on the association itself. It has an impact on the government itself, the government, this trip, and everybody, everybody involved are all beneficiary of this. It's not only the farmers. The private sector that we involve also benefited a lot. The, the, the government itself also benefited enough that by way of this scheme has not been able to generate employment for about almost 10,000 people in Oshu. These younger farmers, see something in agriculture now that you can, it can, it can become a dignified uh, uh, work. It can, you, nobody looks down on farmers in, in our state in particular. Now in, in, in Osho State, nobody looks down on farmers anymore because they can make the basics of life from farming. Osho now is the only satisfied producer that can sell chicken to KFC, number one eatery in the world. Infrastructure is very key for any economic development. The infrastructure of road link community with communities and facilitate trade and commerce. With over 1,000 kilometers of roads and several bridges connecting people to other amenities, the Arabia Shola government has is well wrapped up. It eminently qualifies it for upscaling to the national space. Rural areas serve as nav to urban centers. Only a government that has no foresight will forget that to keep the urban going, you need to keep the rural alive and connected. Rural roads and its maintenance will actually liberate the urban centers eventually. Most people always say city, city, city. But the key issue is that we need the rural community to get work, to get their lives working and functioning properly. And I believe Oshun has started and they're doing well so far. I believe they'll be there. The amount of lives and money lost in the hinterland farms would have made this country five times richer. But since there were no bridges to connect the farm produce and their buyers, since rural dwellers lose tons of farm crops to rot, 
while they waited, waited for a link, a link that only a true governance can give us, we lost money. We lose food. GDP sinks. I'm afraid we have to lose money. Sherry, <laughs> I for Kabale Wafa, Titi Lanri, Titi Law, Talk on Logerege, Baka, or Koma Fire Sole, and you could see Toga Bema. O Guati, Patio Nan. The innovation here is not the building of roads and bridges. No, not at all. Rather, it's a policy of maintenance that Osho employs. Where are the rural road users? take ownership of the roads and maintain them for themselves. The locals in these areas that these roads serve have broken the roads into manageable bits and they take responsibility for them and its sustenance. Didn't we call it the government of the people? By the people? Again, true governance builds human infrastructure. Maintenance is in the hands of the benefiting communities, supervised by RAM and Ministry of Works. It will interest you that the first innovative program of a community-based road maintenance was introduced in Osun State. The maintenance sustainability, we learned it from Osun. Because when they did that in War Road, and we came to see what they did. It was fine, perfect. With over 1,000 kilometers of road within the state, several bridges connecting people with other amenities, a well-manned ambulance service, and great financial partnership with construction firms, we seem to be building a foundation, one that can carry a big vision, a vision that is as big as the one in the state of Washu. The governor came in there, he saw a lot of carnage along the Rubin roads. Many of them have accidents, there's nobody to rescue them. Because, you know, the legal aspect, the police aspect, many people are very reluctant to assist people when they are involved in road traffic accidents. Also, when you are looking at people that are in labor, especially at the community centers, they are not good with our assistance, so we transfer them from that, u that unit to a tertiary institution or a tertiary hospital where you have a specialist, the gynecologist, the, to, be, to take care of those patients and actually sometimes the need of a, I mean, pediatricians. So there's no good coordination about that. Also the medical challenge here has too, there's no good care for them. It was Mr. Governor himself that had that initiative that this agency has to be in existence. That's how the whole thing was created. We are busy in constructing roads, in constructing rail, you're building you know, hospitals and, and schools and all that and all that. You're getting people engaged. And when you engage them, what do they do? They generate income because you pay them. When they have income, what do they do? They go to the market. So it has, you know, multiplier effect. That is during construction. Post-construction, economic activity goes up because the road now becomes usable and people love it. So you, you see, and because of the traffic, even like I said, adjoining properties begin to go up in value. When it does, who takes the benefit? It's the people, and people are a subset of the state. So it's the state ultimately. But now imagine closing your eyes to that and say, you're not going to do that. It's, it's unthinkable. The status at the moment is fluctuating, especially under a military regime. 
many things went, especially including education, which appeared not to have been very important to the military uh, regimes, but is now being resurrected. In human capacity development, education is more important. Uh, the commissioner and himself, the governor too, were all involved in talking about education and I got carried away by what they are trying to do. Uh, a lot of people talk about education both at the state level, at the national level and so on. But I think he succeeded in coming out with a much more simpler and practical way of achieving uh, education. And I would honestly like to see a lot of states copy the model that he is adopting. Education is a bedrock of any society. It is the engine room of human civilization. It is the key to the 21st century. It is the propeller of science, engineering, and technology. Any society that seeks relevance, that seeks to understand society of today and tomorrow, must invest massively in education. For someone who understands governance, education is a weapon. Many of the states are just catching up on what I can call a, a condition of stasis, when everything absolutely stood still. And we see the effect of this in the tertiary institutions, where we have undergraduates who are virtually illiterate, and even worse, ignorant, ignorant of the very disciplines. One of the biggest problems we have is not just, it's not in agriculture. It, it is a combination of problems. The first of, the very first is education. has education, you will be able to pick what you want to do in life. A great African sage, Nelson Mandela, once said that education is the most powerful weapon with which you can change the world. If we as a country are still interested in the business of changing the world, then we need to reinvent our weapon. UNO, UNESCO, NGOs, they recognize the fact that if you don't catch, you know that saying, give your child to me for the first seven years and you can have a child for the rest of his or her life. The uniqueness of the solution proffered by the state of Oshu is the stem and root nature, where our solution is solution to several other problems. So by fixing absenteeism, Oshun has also fixed problems in empowerment, agriculture. They have improved child health, improved equality, and has really been raised the bar very high in e-learning and educational investment. At least one full meal at school guarantees a reasonably healthy body. So, if you like, it's part and parcel of the education process. If you want to provide access to education, you must first invest in the health of the child. You must first ensure that that child is fed with balanced diet. You could look at school health and nutrition interventions as key ways, one, to bring children back into school and to make them healthier to learn when they're in school. And when looking at the numbers, the, 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 num the, the statistics are such that where, where school health and nutrition programs, including school feeding, are implemented, 
the, the absenteeism goes down and increased enrol uh, there's increased enrolment and increased attendance. So there's clearly something we can be doing here in terms of health interventions to get the church to achieve the education for all goals. There are some people today coming to school, not because they want to go to school, but because they are short of one square meal a day. For poor parents, it's a very good reason to send children to school. You know, if you're getting five meals a week free, then that's a, a very significant part of the earnings of a family. You see, a lot of families are distressed, financially distressed. Most of these children in the morning, they just woke up, you say, okay, either go to, go and do some chores, go to school, and on empty stomach. A human being, a patriot, got up and said, and identified food as one of the major problems. You know, uh, militating against school enrollment and why a lot of people even drop out of school because sometimes they go near, uh, near, uh, near nearby bushes to look for fruits to eat, and in process they won't be part of the class. Sometimes they won't uh, uh, they won't go again. You saw a man, you know, develop this food policy. Now a lot of children were now attracted to schools. Since the one meal a day program has been introduced into schools in Oshu, I have it on record from my research that school enrollment. Doubled. A lot of people joined the army because of the uniform. And school children now see their, their peers wearing uniforms. So they say, is, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you rather go to a place where you are giving uniform than go to stay at home or, or be on the street? You saw some, there was a report, I think, the other nation, one of the papers did it, where a lot of children who were given other mangoes or things to go and say, they'll go and drop it and go to school first. Because they were attracted by just that food. You see, the food now developed a chain, a multiplier effect that affected farmers, affected food vendors, affected the community, the same thing with the, with the uniforms. And fundamentally, because of the upsurge, if you go to Oshun, like what I witnessed, you will not see modern schools go. A lot of children were not in schools. So when you have hundreds of thousands of schools, you have to build bigger and better schools, which he did. The international award-winning program is responsible for very impressive results in the senior school leaving certificate exams. Ease on the financial involvement of parents in the education of their words. And for the heck of it, these students for once can brag to be computer literate as a result of working on these devices. The second best practice that can be copied from the state of Washington is bring back the book, the e-book. It has come out with what is called Okoyimo, Tablet of Knowledge. It's an e-learning tool comprising all the 17 subjects being done at secondary school level, whether at the level of Neko at the level of WAEC. But it got beyond that to have about five additional subjects dealing with Bible, dealing with Quran, and dealing with the old Ifa corpus, dealing with the history of Yoruba and Sifis. So many that look, in this tablet of knowledge, unless you are lazy that you cannot read, you cannot claim you don't have books to read. It has another collateral advantage of getting them InfoTech compliant. So you are saying that use this part, you know, printing, some, but for the children, what else can you do? You bring them into the world class straight away by getting them to be info compliant. From the very beginning, you know, uh, equip your equipment intellectually. Then of course, you bring up the children intellectually, relevantly, that is in relation to history, culture, environment, even the mathematical methods of teaching mathematically, you know, can vary from place to place, depends you know, what results you get ultimately. So I have a copy. So and the appointment of Oshu State, I think it's really first class. The financial assistance that is indirectly being given to the parents is enormous. If you have to buy textbooks on 16 subjects, or on 20 subjects, or at, at worst, nine subjects, for those in the final class, it's a lot of money. I know how much people pay.
to buy a textbook of physics, textbook of chemistry, and you are not buying only one. You will have to buy two or three, and then uh, some uh, question and answers, uh, something. So it's a lot of cost that the government has taken off the shoulders of the parents. I believe that uh, what's happening in Oshun today is something which, uh, I don't like to use the word emulate, let's just say study it to see what you can extract in, I can think of a number, and Oshun also can look over the wall, see what other places uh, are doing. In the case of Oshun State, I think the educational experimentation there is worth the attention of other states. The kind of program going on in Oshun State, the nation should learn from it, Federal states and so should learn from it. That governors is not about the buildings, not about the roads, not about the secretaries, about human beings, about people. And that's what is important, and that's what we're seeing happening in Nigeria. He was determined to get youth employed, get them engaged properly. Remove them from the life of idleness that can create crimes and all of that. So, he, the oh yes uh, kind of a creative program to get youth employed, to get, get them engaged. Youth Empowerment Scheme, which we have read from very far, has become a role model for many states. The cadets wearing uniform and walking uh, could be related to what had happened in many communist country in the world, countries in the world. A lot of the food vendors in the local community would have been empowered. Food vendors would be empowered. Farmers of food, staple food. The food they were giving were not imported from America, probably from Europe. They were locally produced food. The eggs, the poultry farmers would be enhanced because they would be paid. The, the cassava farmers, you know, will, will be turned into business. And even the food vendors will be there. Hey, hey. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. It is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that frightens us the most. We ask ourselves, who are we not to be talented, not to be gorgeous? Indeed, who are we not to be? You can see it every day. Young people have no jobs. Uh, they don't have work to do. My concern is not the unavailability of jobs or the low flow of resources. My worry is the few hands that will harness them and a system that will best allocate them. The system that will not enrich the individual and hurt deeply the majority poor and feeble. A system that is truly for all. That is my worry. You can set young people up to create jobs for themselves. If the economy will not grow fast enough to create the jobs, if the government cannot figure out how to create the jobs, then we might as well teach a young person that if you look in your community and you see that everybody has dirt, well, make it an opportunity, be the one packing the dirt and charge all of them for it and then make money uh, and just do it in a profitable way. Oh yes, it's um, an acronym for Shun Youth Empowerment Scheme. We started in uh, 2010 and uh, February 2011 we were able to uh, put together 
at the first batch of OES. The idea was to run a pilot program in three senatorial districts in Oshun and have about a hundred young people attend in each of them. After the training, we went on to do some deployment. We deployed them into sanitation, deployed them into green gang and into public works. The idea was Generation Enterprise would set up an entrepreneurship program that would serve as an exit program for the OES cadets so that they can move into the entrepreneurship route and then be set up on their own doing business. The strongest sectors for uh, stable jobs in the next 10, 10 years or 15 years in Africa would be number one, government, of course, because it's government. Two, manufacturing. Three, retail and hospitality. Now, if you have that information, then you start to guide your businesses toward uh, creating businesses in that, in that space. Somebody will say, I cannot do this job. And you are lazing off at home. You are wasting off your life. You finish education 2007 and you don't have anything to do. Welcome. Why don't you come and try this? Change your attitude. Let your expectation be geared to what is available. So we got that done. What is Aqualara? Your first instrument of worth making is your hand. And if you are able to change your mind about your mentality, about what I can do and what I cannot do, and you are concerned about what is available to be done and what can make money for me, then you are okay. I mean, I mean, you not join at your at your or your lag bara. Thank you, oh yes. But you move back home. Tell me, so I better see me my bar. Is there no law? Ambalo, Ambalo, dear dear, nobody you produce. No funny, a girl, no more. I shall hold in me as I was crying, woman, at a genuine legal. Good way. Oh, what's it to bet us? Don't be at all too full of poor, too poor people, oh, Debora, and that tea at the Berisha, oh, you see. That I want tea with a queen, Julie, the town, the Tabes, and more than one day, and then they are finding the city. Must encourage people to move on and conquer poverty. And you conquer poverty through education, through engagement of mind, through, uh, through activities that you know, uh, can be very inspiring, no matter how, how little, to be able to have hope and self-belief. It also helps to fight poverty in a number of ways. Yeah. Because 750,000 uniforms is massive. It's massive in one scale. And it's not something one person, two persons can do. So you now have a situation in the state whereby it has generated, it has created a new industry all on its own, the garment industry all on its own. We have over 3,000 people who have now been trained into the art of producing, of tailoring, and of sewing. And don't forget, by once they've learned that, basically, because they know there's a show market to produce uniforms, to work in the factory producing uniforms, they don't have to just produce uniforms alone. They can sew a shirt for you. They can sew a butter for you. Because once you learn one, it's easy to go to the next one as a tailor. If we worked with only a hundred in a year, they should generally create about 10 jobs. That makes about a thousand jobs in uh, one year. Now, if we were to do that over five years, we can easily say that we would have created 5,000 jobs. We only realize that the army of unemployed youth is a huge threat to society. So, oh yes, must come to meet that need. To date, 40,000 of our youth who either to had no employment at all are engaged in community, social, and public work. From which they earn a living. You talk about the, the, the meals, the one meal per day program, you understand? Farmers 
are now sure if we are dealing with 300,000 elementary school students that must be fed every single day. If you are giving them one egg per day, that is 300,000 eggs. You see, I was part of the team that put together the oatmeal program. 3,007 food vendors were recruited. And one interesting thing is that at the beginning it was an experiment. But our Dibo of Benny, all on the right at Igba one, O Benny, Igba Mary, C. Shay, along Mama Kemina, Yan Bikini, who shall do fellow the long frame, but see, if they reckon him, my day, or long coming Yambe, and you know, tell Kalara one, who she share, I reckon best, Latin Marche, a toonje, four woman, lay we. It's yielding high result in form of empowering the 3,007 uh, 3, food vendors. I'm going to show you a little bit. 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 If it is a mini job today, you come from there. Eh? Get a professional uh, uh, development of self-worth in the future and be a great person. Basically, the government provided a loan facility for each of them to the tune of 41,500 Naira. So, if you calculate the total number of people, now farmers, crop growers, fish farmers, poultry farmers, transporters, the food vendors themselves, and perhaps the food vendor also has someone who is epping him or her, or who is epping her, because most of them, they are ladies, of course, who is epping her at home with the cooking. That's one person employed, plus the person originally employed by the government, making two. That's 6,000. If you replicate that all over the nation, you will keep devil's work out of the hand of the people. It's a vision, not just an ordinary mission. That is not hopeful. It is a, a recreation of hope, self worth, determination, perseverance, and ability to, 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 to fend for yourself and be challenged to, to want to succeed. I draw my inspiration in the need to improve the conditions of living of our people. Arabo Sula could better be described as a revolutionary and a visionary. Someone who sees governance as service. No matter what you will credit or benefit with, for me, his greatest insignia of achievement is the fact that he has demystified the art of governance. I ran a military government dictatorship. The governor is running a democratic government. He has been able to navigate this very well to the satisfaction of people. Your mission belongs to all if you have the opportunity to impact that mission on the society. Do it with courage, determination and consistency. And that is what he's doing there. I represent the basic ordinary Nigerian, born into an ordinary Yoruba or Nigerian family, struggling to make ends meet, struggling to raise their children, and struggling, praying, working hard to live a better life. So living, therefore, in our society with the challenges that 
come with it. It's normal. I understand the frustrations. I understand the pains. I understand the agitation of the ordinary people because I had no other experience than that. Many see him differently, but I see him always as a Marxist with a vision who is people-oriented, people-grounded, and people-focused. The Osho State Government was born out of a solid blueprint. I draw my inspiration. I have my motivation in the need to improve the conditions of living of our people. I'm a product of the struggle of the people for improved life, for fulfillment generally, socially, economically, and spiritually. Any leader that stays, in a, in a, stays on a high horse and then has exclusive zones within where he says he's governing, where he cannot even go there, any leader that stays in a place and is surrounded by people who tell him only what he wants to hear and does not want to step out to hear exactly what the people he claims to be leading are saying and thinking and seeing about what he's doing is a leadership that is doomed to failure. One of the things that struck me is his ability to mix with people of divergent uh, opinion, people of different backgrounds. There is no question in my mind that the greatest security a leader can have is the heart of the people. If he has the heart of the people, he's safer. There can be one madman who will do something. After all, even Gandhi was assassinated. But that's a price for history. No, I think one of my greatest yardstick about measuring how people relate with other people, uh, I will rate him very high. <laughs> Following the route of governance as we know it will mean abdicating the historic responsibility of serving the people, of meeting their core needs, of representing them in government. He was not inhibited by this paraphernalia of uh, office. He is natural. His approach in mingling with people is the natural way of doing things. And not all leaders do that because the security and the rest of them will shield them or fend them off. But I found in the governor, His Excellency uh, Raouf, he, he feels he is there with them. He hasn't got any encumbrances in his dealing with people, and that makes him unique. It's a valuable desire to impact on humanity as a whole. And I commend his vision. The mission is clear. His articulation of policy is strongly inspiring. This is a leader in his own right. Without, without human beings, there will just be empty spaces. There, there won't be nations, there won't be states, there won't be settlements. So if humans are not there, then life itself will not be what it is. Therefore, rather, rather than celebrate a hero, or look for a hero, what we must all bother about is the impact we make at all levels on the lives of the people. And I believe that what uh, Governor Aregbe Shola is doing is trying to get people to see that he not only understands that Nigeria is changing, but that he is one of those driving that change. Lagos Infrastructural Foundation would not have been possible without the knowledge and commitment of uh, Ralph Varegeshola. I'm not an engineer. <laughs> <laughs>
all I was a governor to sign and debate and uh, allow my vision to flourish. And it's transferring that vision to Osho. I salute you. Our vision drives our passion for action. And all of this is geared towards making Osho a reference point in human development.